Just looking around, seeing who's who's logged on and let's, let's see. Well, it's four at four oh one, so I guess we should get started. Uh, as you can tell, I'm not in my office. This is a, a COVID day at home work from home day. Um, so I just want to start by just, you know, as I said before, good afternoon. Thank everyone for, for being able to join another virtual meeting of our commission to study mental and behavioral health in Maryland. Um, this is the second to the last commission meeting of the year. The next meeting will be December 8th. Uh, so I just want to remind everyone that um, in about a week and a half, well, I guess about a week where we are, week and a half, the 13th, uh, we asked the subcommittees to get their recommendations to us with regard to deliverables to submit uh, uh, with regard to the year end report, our 2020 report. Um, last week, you may have received an email from Heather uh, Poston in my office letting you know that um, this afternoon we'll be discussing last year's recommendations, including where we currently are with, with each of those recommendations and any additional steps that we're gonna need to take to realize them. I expect that this year's re report will build upon our previous report while also contending with some of the ongoing um, pandemic issues and how it has shifted things, not only in government uh, institutions, but also for the folks that are in the mental health community, both individuals who are suffering and as well as those caregivers and providers. Um, before we get into that portion, of course, as usual, I'd just like everyone to introduce themselves and then we'll, um, well, before we hear uh, updates from the subcommittees um, will approve the minutes. And then after that, this, after that, we can discuss recommendations for the uh, report, particularly as it relates to um, um, the previous report and where we stand. And then um, public testimony uh, for that portion of the meeting. So with that said, um, you know, it's not like we can go around the table, and I, I think it went pretty well last time in terms of people just introducing themselves, but as best as you can, uh, let's let's all introduce ourselves. I'm Boyd Rutherford, Lieutenant Governor. Sharadi, I'm the Assistant Medicaid Director for Maryland. Senator Director, Midshore Legislator, Senate. Leah Jones, Deputy Secretary for the Behavioral Health Administration. Uh, I'm Barbara Allen. I am the co-chair of the Behavioral Health Advisory Council and exec executive director of James Place. Pat Metaszewski, I'm a family advocate with lived experience and I'm a registered nurse. Steve Karen Shue, Blake. executive director of the Opioid Operational Command Center. I'm Karen Dr. Lewis Young, delegate from Frederick County. I'm Dr. Tripurini. I'm a child psychiatrist working as an associate medical director at Kaiser Permanente in the Mid Atlantic States. Jim Perone was the director of First Step in Baltimore County, an outpatient mental health and substance abuse treatment program. Mary Cho, I'm the CEO of Cornerstone Montgomery, a behavioral health provider in Montgomery County. Tiffany Rexrode, Acting Assistant Deputy Secretary of Programs for the Department of Human Services. Hi, I'm Mary Gable, Assistant State Superintendent with the Maryland State Department of Education. Hi, I'm Kathleen Borain, Maryland Insurance Commissioner. 
Hi, I'm Dr. Here. Linda Bineski. I'm the Acting Director of Mental Health for the Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services. Hi, I'm Katie Fry Hester. I'm the Senator for District 9, Howard and Carroll County. I'm David Cooney. I'm the Associate Commissioner for Life and Health at the Maryland Insurance Administration. I'm Kimber Watts. I'm an Assistant Public Defender. Good afternoon. I'm Richard Abbott. I'm Director of Juvenile Family Services for the Maryland Judiciary. Okay. Any any additional members of the commission uh, online? Uh, Christian Mealy, Deputy Secretary of Disabilities. Oh, okay. That's Christian. Okay. All right. Um, okay. With that taken care of. Uh, does anyone have any questions or edits with regard to the meeting minutes from October 6? Okay. Um, well, do I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Okay, um, if we can get an update from our subcommittees and we can start with the crisis services subcommittee. Okay, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. I'd like to start by uh, thanking the Lieutenant Governor for his ongoing commitment to mental and behavioral health and substance use related issues in our state. And I, I hope everybody involved with this commission appreciates how unusual it is to have someone of stature the senior brass take such hands-on engagement in an enterprise like this. We, we do appreciate it, Lieutenant Governor. Oh, thank you. On behalf of my office, the Opioid Operational Command Center, I also want to thank uh, the rest of our partners from the various subcommittees of the commission for their efforts. Uh, last year, the Crisis Services Subcommittee had two recommendations included in the Mental and Behavioral Health Commission's annual report. One was to develop a comprehensive crisis response system, and the other was to improve our crisis hotlines. As most of you know, the Crisis Services Subcommittee has a standing goal of developing a comprehensive crisis coordination system. This is a goal that has become increasingly important as the coronavirus pandemic has progressed. Our colleagues at the Behavioral Health Administration are taking the lead on developing a comprehensive crisis system. In recent weeks, BHA has met internally to determine its approach and has determined that there will be uh, value in having an external advisory group to guide the project. BHA is in the process of forming such a group uh, that will include both external and internal stakeholders, and that will meet for the first time later this year. At the group's first meeting, BHA will present for review and comment a foundational document based on SAMHSA's National Guidelines for Behavioral Health Crisis Care. We're excited to have BHA leading this effort and are excited about the possibilities presented by involving the expertise of professionals from outside of state government. We're pleased that there are several funding streams available to support the expansion of Maryland's crisis services infrastructure. The OCC has provided over a quarter million dollars to fund the Maryland Medicaid Administration's implementation of a pilot project that will expand comprehensive crisis response centers using the state's existing outpatient mental health clinic or OMHC infrastructure. This is a very exciting initiative. Additionally, the Maryland Health Services Cost Review Commission's Regional Catalyst Grants Program, the health department's state opioid response to funding and the behavioral health crisis fund also known as hb 1092 will each be sources of monies to enhance our crisis response capabilities our subcommittee also recommended improving the crisis hotline in maryland so we're grateful that a portion of the state's soar 2 funding has been allocated to enhance the 211 press 1 system 211 Press 1 will offer 24-7 support anywhere in the state for people experiencing a substance use or mental health crisis. The hotline staff will be able to offer Marylanders screening, assessment, 
intervention and referral services over the phone. Additionally, BHA is working on infrastructure enhancements that will allow local 211 press one calls to be routed to local crisis hotlines instead of to the five regional hubs that are currently in operation. This will greatly improve efficiency with which callers can be connected to services. Finally, we continue our work to promote standardized training in the behavioral health field. Our office facilitated an agreement among BHA, the Maryland Institute for Emergency Medical Services Systems, or MIMS, and the Mental Health Association of Maryland. The agreement provides mental health first aid training to EMS professionals and to first responders, providing them with skills necessary to provide initial support to those in crisis. This is a three-year project that will train hundreds of EMS responders. Before I wrap up, I'd like to acknowledge Senator Hester and Dr. Bonesky's work through the Public Safety Subcommittee to host a sequential intercept model summit. This is also very exciting. This summit will be held November 17th and 18th, and the Crisis Services Subcommittee is honored to co-host the event alongside the Public Safety Subcommittee. Thank you as always for your continued commitment to these issues and for your collaboration. This commission represents the type of collaboration that makes our individual contributions more effective and the OCC is, is proud to be a part of it. Uh, please feel free to contact us at help.oocc at maryland.gov. That's help.oocc at maryland.gov if we can be of any assistance whatsoever. Thank you, back to you, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you. Steve, you mentioned, and I, I rifled through to grab my uh, notebook, but you mentioned a there's a mental health community, and I, I lost it in that period of time. But the outpatient the, mental health clinics? Yes, the outpatient mental health clinics. Thank you. Yeah, this is really uh, exciting. This, this, to the best of my knowledge, was first identified as an opportunity by uh, Health Department Chief Operating Officer Dennis Schrader, who pointed out that there are about 120 outpatient mental health clinics uh, positioned throughout Maryland, at least one in every jurisdiction in the state. These um, outpatient clinics have been deeply involved in mental health issues for many years uh, and are gradually getting slow walked into substance use disorder because of co-occurring conditions. Right. And the light bulb kind of went off that we, we should be assisting these OMHCs in any way we can to uh, expand their range of service offerings to cover the full range of behavioral health services and not to just limit themselves to uh, mental health services. There are a lot of challenges. There are payer issues. There are licensing issues. Their yes. capital is an issue. All of those things. Yeah. How how are they funded? Are they funded through um, Medicaid on a patient basis? Medicaid, Medicare, private insurance. I'll defer to Dr. Jones. That's correct. They they operate on a fee for service model, uh, whether they take medical assistance, Medicare, or private insurances, or. Um, well, most what you're talking about an outpatient mental health clinic, most of those are not going to be cash based, but I imagine that some of them could have a, a sliding scale for folks who don't have um, insurance and who don't want to use um, um, state insurance for some particular reason. But yes, it, it, is a, it is a pay for individual, pay for service model, pay for service model. So I, I would imagine it's, it's a voluntary service that people take, is it only for adults or do they um, have children and adolescents? No, it's the full full age range. So you um, you have you can have OMHCs that take young children uh, up to the elderly, um, even um, patients who have dementia who could be seen at an OMHC, provided they have the appropriate staffing. Okay. So it's, it's the life, it's, li it's lifespan care. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, it would be, okay, just a thought, thank you. Thank you. I guess the uh, youth and families. I know uh, Kristen Mealy is on. Thanks, Lieutenant Governor. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. So, uh, as I mentioned during our last full commission meeting, the uh, youth and family subcommittee, uh, it was just better for our planning purposes to get everybody uh, to our meetings <clears throat> that we went to a standing meeting um, on our calendar, which is this coming Monday. So, 
I will have more to report out after this coming Monday's meeting. But what I did ask um, in preparation for this meeting, just to give you some update, um, I asked all of our the work groups that we formed in our subcommittee to at least give me a report of their activities and the, the discussions they've been having to just have something to report out for today, even though the full subcommittee convenes on Monday. So um, as I mentioned uh, last go around, we, we formed three work groups, uh, licensure and reciprocity is the focus of one, uh, Maryland's behavioral health rating is the second one, and the youth and adolescent substance use disorder treatment work group is the third. So uh, the licensure and reciprocity work group was created to explore areas related to licensure out of state, specifically when we're talking about telehealth services. And it's, they're, they're really focused on answering uh, four questions. How could providers and, and licensing move more fluidly between the states? Uh, we are looking at the different boards and regulations. And so we've been working with, with health, the Department of Health on ascertaining all the health occupations boards and looking that, you know, each state has a different or non-existent entry registration process for out-of-state providers. So looking at that, um, we're, uh, they're exploring the common denominators across all the health professions that uh, have a licensure component. And uh, also whether these reciprocity laws have some sort of check uh, and balance, like if there was malpractice, you know, where would that be reported and or enforced? Um, this work group has created a working document that outlines all the licensure boards that offer information on uh, licensure statutes and whether or not they have interstate compacts, uh, which would also be helpful for us to know. Um, the second work group for, uh, that's focusing on the behavioral health rating, uh, while this group is looking at the language and policies surrounding involuntary commitment, uh, we do intend to hear all sides of this, um, of this issue and plan to have some conversations at our next subcommittee meeting to further discussion. Uh, I know we've talked to the Mental Health Association of Maryland about this briefly. So we wanna make sure that all stakeholders um, can contribute their points of view to this discussion. Um, so far, this work group has looked at, the, looked at the definition of, I'm gonna butcher this, anosognosia. I don't know if, if I pronounced that right, but uh, particularly that definition and its relation to involuntary commitment. And they're also reviewing Maryland statutes um, related to uh, involuntary evaluation and hospital treatment and other states' danger standards. And then finally, the Youth and Adolescent Substance Use Disorder Treatment Work Group has met and is discussing whether or not the absence of residential treatment for adolescents with a serious substance use disorder in the state is a violation of parity laws for youth on Medicaid or of the early and periodic screening diagnosis and treatment Medicaid regulation. So again, we'll know more about these work groups, whether they have specific uh, things that they'd like the subcommittee to consider and potentially lift up to the full commission during the next round of recommendations. Turn my mic back on. Kristen, um, with regard to licensing and reciprocity, uh, one of the things we have talked about was the um, reciprocity with regard to counselors. And this had, this was, a lot of this is not just with the, um, mental health side, but substance use disorder, uh, being able to have counselors that can come across state lines and not have to go through as many of the hoops uh, that sometimes occur because of our licensing. Um, there is a, a development of a compact uh, for um, uh, counselors, um, uh, trying to remember which board it is that, that regulates it here in Maryland. Uh, but the board director was was working with some of the other states with regard to the compact, and then we'll have to follow up with her, but it would require some implement implementation legislation to allow us to join that compact with regard to uh, counselors. And I believe they both would cover both substance use disorder and uh, mental health counselors. Um, so I can follow up. I have to go back and look at my notes. I know Mark, I think Mark uh, is on this line. And uh, we can look, we can get that information to you as well. But uh, we need to follow up and see where where that particular board is on um, that whole question. Uh, that, would be, so, that would be great. So this is Mark. Uh, yes, so you're indeed correct. That the Board of Professional Councils and Therapists they were drafting legislation. Mm -hmm. They're hoping to have it ready for uh, the next legislative session. Uh, and it takes ten states to join the pact to to enact uh, to enact the compact. 
Um, they're just now, uh, they're, they're finishing up the final draft of the legislation. Hope to have it sometime this month. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, and who did I leave out? Okay. Uh, finance and funding. Good evening. Uh, hopefully you can hear me this time. Governor. Good. Um, so just real quickly, uh, Steve, I, I know that um, you just gave an update on the wonderful grant that we received from the Opioid C Command Center. Um, again, it's about 270,000. Um, we had our kickoff meeting this past week with, uh, with a great group of stakeholders. Um, again, we'll be um, using the money um, to basically look at OMHCs, as Steve mentioned, um, and looking to see how we can leverage the existing um, provider network that they already offer in the state of Maryland, and basically look to see what new services we potentially could add on to that network. Um, it, in Medicaid, we're looking at um, this would require um, defining them as a new provider type. Um, so there would be licensing issues, reimbursement issues. And again, um, it, you know, we, we are looking for something that we can offer statewide. Um, that's, um, that's one of the things to keep in mind in, in, in Medicaid is that when we implement a new service, we're looking at, at, we're required to implement something on a statewide basis. So there's comparability across, um, across the the state. Um, so we're we're going to be again working with stakeholders over the next year, and we just kicked um, that work group off this uh, this week. Um, just to give you also a, a quick update on where we are with system of care. Um, as we had mentioned before, um, we had kind of uh, de we delayed those meetings for a period of time. When the pandemic first um, started, um, we've started back with um, getting those work groups back together. Um, we are only focusing on the main work group, not the subcommittees, just given all the other issues that are happening right now. Um, but we've we've had presentations um, from the MCOs to learn from from them of how they've been, um, how they develop their networks. Um, and if there's different tools that we can leverage on the uh, ASO fever service side, on the behavioral health side. Um, we're continuing to work on our provider manuals um, for both the ASO and the locals. Um, and, um, and we continue to work on our, um, the work that's required under the HOPE Act in terms of developing cost-based rates with providers. So we've been having um, various discussions on those topics. Um, we are uh, meeting internally to kind of um, map out what we think we can accomplish over the next six months or so, um, and then we'll be reviewing that with the, with the, um, with the work group. And with that, I'll, I guess I would hand it over to Commissioner Brain. Hi, thank you. So um, for our part, in terms of this, this work stream, our focus has really been on two things. The first has to do with uh, parity in terms of insurers, commercial insurers um, coverage and uh, access, and then also with regard to network adequacy. So the, as people recall, the Maryland General Assembly did pass legislation this past session, uh, which is now codified at 15144, that has the Maryland Insurance Administration developing regulations to uh, assess um, parity between you know, medical surgical services and um, mental health services. The MIA's first task will be to promulgate regulations that identify metrics and measurements to as we look at the um, NQTLs to see how parity is playing out, whether there is parity. And the first step in that is really understanding and identifying what are the proper uh, parity metrics. So we uh, will be sending this advertising out probably tomorrow, maybe Monday but we will hold our first public um, stakeholder meeting on November 23rd. And we will go through, uh, we'll have a report on the Milliman national reports that have been developed. We will also hear from the Path Forward. Um, we will also hear from the Bowman Family Foundation, which has been working extensively uh, in this area and has supported a number of state 
um, departments of insurance as they go through a similar effort. So that will be step one in this process. With respect to the, um, the network adequacy project, which is broader than mental health services, but certainly mental health services and the adequacy of, of networks is a big part of that. I'll let David uh, Cooney speak to where we are with that. All right, thank you, Commissioner. Um, so yeah, I'll give a, a brief update on um, both the MIA's network adequacy regulations and the reviews of the access plans themselves. So as we've mentioned previously, the MIA convened, convened a stakeholder work group last fall to analyze our existing network adequacy regulations and identify areas for improvement. We had several public meetings that ended over the summer where we engaged in an open discussion with stakeholders about areas where the regulations could be improved. We also accepted written comments through August 19th. Based on that feedback we got from stakeholders, we had several meetings of our internal MIA work group and uh, we began drafting revisions to the regulations, um, taking into account stakeholder suggestions and also other issues that we had noted internally. So just yesterday, we posted a draft pre-publication version of those revised regulations on our website. And we'll be accepting public comments on that draft for the next 30 days. And this is our, our pretty much our standard procedure where we would like to expose a draft regulation for public comment prior to formally proposing it and giving uh, all the stakeholders an option, an opportunity to weigh in. Uh, after we get the comments, we intend to hold another public meeting to discuss the draft regulations that'll likely be in mid-December. And then we'll consider all the public comments and make any additional changes that we um, determine are necessary before we will actually at that time formally publish the proposed regulations in the Maryland Register. The initial draft does include um, a good bit of changes and additions. It does reflect a greater emphasis on measuring network adequacy for mental health and substance abuse specifically, and also kind of how telehealth fits in with network adequacy. Uh, turning now to the reviews of the network adequacy plans themselves, the in-depth reviews of the 2019 plans, which we've been discussing previously, that took much longer than anticipated as we continued to receive and request additional information from the carriers through the early part of this past summer. We were waiting for the reviews of all the 2019 plans to be completed prior to making any decisions on final orders, but we are at the point now we've obtained and analyzed all the necessary information. The orders are being finalized and we expect to start issuing them very soon. In the meantime, we also received the 2020 network access plans on July 1st. Those reviews are also ongoing. We had issued a bulletin over the summer that permitted carriers to file updated information for their 2020 plans after July 1st, if uh, the impacts of the pandemic had kind of interfered with their ability to obtain and report accurate data by the deadline. So that updated information was due in September. And some of the information we received did include uh, revised executive summaries, and that's public information. So that information has been posted to the MIA website. What we've seen so far with the preliminary reviews, of the 2020 plans, is there was overall improvement in compliance with some of the metrics that are specific to mental health and substance use disorder providers. But there was also worsening of performance with other standards, and all the plans failed to uh, meet the standard for at least one of the mental health and substance use disorder metrics. So for 2020, we've expanded the team of analysts who are reviewing those filings, and we're working to ensure the reviews for all the 2020 plans are coordinated and consistent, and we anticipate the reviews will be completed much faster this year. And uh, that concludes our summary. And that concludes the MIA's report. All right, thank, thank you. Um, question in terms of network adequacy, is, is that something that you do, that review? Is that part of, I guess, the licensing, the ability of the, the carrier to do business in the state? And then you go back if you find that they're inadequate, but they already are licensed to do business in the state. What, what, what steps can you take? So there are statutes that govern the, um, the standards uh, at a high level of network adequacy. And if you are, if you choose to have a provider panel, which you don't have to do, but all carriers actually do, um, then that panel has to meet certain requirements and, and it has to be large enough to provide access to care 
from both a uh, geographic perspective and a time perspective. And the MIA has then promulgated regulations several years ago that, that lay out those um, standards in, in more detail. So if a carrier doesn't, and also requires, as the legislature has done, the carrier to file an annual plan so that we can evaluate whether they are in compliance with the statutory directive of having an adequate network. Um, if they fail to, um, to have an adequate network, so if they fail to file a plan, if they fail to provide enough information, if their network itself is, is in, uh, inadequate, we have a variety of enforcement mechanisms at our disposal. Um, it, they would ultimately include, you know, um, revoking a carrier's license. That would be an extreme circumstance. More likely we would, um, we would require the carrier to come into compliance. Uh, we would issue particular directives. We might um, issue sanctions in the form of administrative penalties. David, you may have some other thoughts about what the tools are in our tool belt. Mostly it would be directing them to comply. Yeah, I think you pretty much covered it, Commissioner. How do you define, you know, what an adequate network? Well, that's the bazillion dollar question. And it's been the part that's been, you know, the subject of so much controversy. And there's a lot of sort of very high level agreement on very basic concepts like um, having, being able to get to a provider within a certain distance. And so how far do you have to go and how quickly can you get an appointment? So there's, there's sort of a broad agreement that those are kind of core considerations of adequacy. However, the disagreement and the devil is in all the details. So how do you actually measure that and how deep do you go? So we can't just think about um, uh, primary care physicians. We also need to think about specialists and what is adequate for a network you know, in dealing with you know, basic care uh, is different than dealing with specialty care. And when we look at specialty care, when and particularly when we look into behavioral and substance abuse care, what are those? What what is a what, what levels of provider? What level of specialty are we looking at? So, and and what happens when you've got in some very very you know specific types of areas of expertise? You know, you may have twenty providers in an entire state. So is your network adequate if you've contracted with 10 of them or not? And so these are the kinds of detailed questions. What the MIA did was promulgate in 2017 a set of standards that looked at how far away people were based on certain specialties of care, um, how survey methodologies for uh, trying to identify how long it took uh, patients to be able to get to a doctor across different specialties what the MIA has learned, and I, I wasn't here, but what I've seen, and I believe as the stakeholder meetings have demonstrated, the, the metrics that the MIA were using needed to be more precise and needed to be refined. And so that's what the public hearings have really been about over the course of the last year or so, are getting, um, looking more precisely at how do we do a better job at honing in on identifying how long does it take people to get someplace, how far do they have to go, and what's really fair and reasonable when you begin to look at um, specialist services as opposed to more general services. And um, you know, this time around, as I think people will see from the regulations that we just posted, we do much, uh, much more detail. We go much, much deeper in terms of specialists, and we are much more focused on substance abuse and mental health treatment. And, and David has really been very much, you know, the mastermind behind many of these um, these changes to these regulations, and you know he can provide you know far more detail on the direction that we're going in. So, um, beha behavioral health generally, um, I guess, mental health and substance use disorder treatment would be considered those specialty areas where the amount of specialists may be less in a state than say general practitioners. And so then there's a, a heavier or diff, more difficult question uh, or at least challenging question what, whether that network is adequate. Well, and it hits in two places, right? The, the first is yes, um, you, you do have less providers. So carriers anecdotally talk to us about how many providers are there. But then secondly, you can't force a provider 
to contract to be on your panel. So what happens? And so what are the drivers? Why is it that certain providers may not want to join panels? Is it an economic issue? Is it a paperwork issue? What are what are the, the drivers of people not wanting to be on the panel? And if you cannot get an adequate panel, even after um, you've undertaken kind of all the reasonable efforts, what does that mean? So does it mean that carriers have to do kind of one-off arrangements? Who absorbs that gap in payment when a carrier doesn't have or isn't able to have an adequate panel? Those are really public policy decisions, but you know, that's, David, I don't know if you have any more specifics with that with regard to sort of where the specialty areas are. I mean, I think that was a good overview. I mean, the regulations do go into to specifics and we struggled with how granular to make it because the more granular you, you get, the, the less likely it is that, that we can come up with a standard that the carers can actually meet, even if they contracted with, with every provider in the state. And, and that's really been a struggle to figure that out. So our, our initial, the current regulations from 2017, it, it's really broad. It kind of maybe has urgent versus non-urgent for mental health and substance abuse. And in certain situations, mental health and substance abuse were lumped together. So we've proposed really completely splitting out mental health and substance abuse. And then we've identified specific specialties under each of those categories um, based on services that are customarily covered under Maryland policies. And it tried to make sure we had separate uh, metrics, at least for some of those, those major categories that the carriers really need to have providers in their network in order to be able to provide the services they have in their contracts. Uh, Dr. Uh, Chiparani, I know yes. I butchered your name. Um, you're in a unique position. Um, That's right. You work for both a provider and you're, a, or at least a, a carrier and you're a provider. Um, how's your experience been with regard to, you know, network adequacy? Um, sure. Yeah, the network adequacy is a double-edged sword. In a sense, uh, it is great to have a, a broad array of providers as contractor providers within the network, but that does not necessarily mean that they are able to provide access to the care. Ultimately, you could have 100 providers in the network that are contracted with, especially we all know to seek an appointment with a psychiatrist or even specialized in psychotherapy is very difficult. If you cannot find appointments and patients and members are not able to seek uh, care timely, uh, having um, a wide array of network providers as contracted and meeting the network adequacy alone uh, probably will not meet our members' needs. So I do think the network adequacy standards needed to be paired with ability of the members or the population to seek care and measure access into our patients getting access to care and how long does it take for a member to get an initial consultation appointment or an evaluation appointment from the time they made an effort to contact the member. Uh, as an example, uh, in Maryland, the Medicaid behavioral health services were carved out from the MCOs. And uh, as a Kaiser Permanente, we are one of the HMO organizations where we cannot provide behavioral health services for those members. And then we would have to redirect them because of the state regulations to opt out. And uh, believe it or not, we get uh, zillions of complaints from members uh, begging us, can we come back and see you? And we said, unfortunately, we cannot because the state has decided to carve the care out. Uh, please contact them and we provide their toll free number and the supervisor's number. And if they still have issues, to contact the state Medicaid office. So we tend to see those challenges uh, if there aren't any tight regulations to pair just not only the network adequacy of number of providers contracted with, but at the same time, making sure they're getting adequate access in timely interval. Okay. Um, did you say that <clears throat> you as a HMO, uh, Kaiser as a HMO is, is not yes. able to provide certain services? Yep, uh, the Maryland Medicaid memberships, mental health services are carved out by the state of Maryland, 
uh, to uh, one vendor the state chose as optimum behavioral health. None of the uh, Maryland state's uh, uh, Medicaid MCOs can provide uh, mental health care, which is kind of uh, unique and unfortunate because there's no other state, I'm, I'm not aware of any other states who carves out because when you provide integrated care within the same organization, uh, patients have much better care and much coordinated care and with a single unified electronic medical record within the same system uh, provides much more uniform care. But I guess whatever the reason, um, Maryland has decided and we hope it will revisit that issue at some point down the road. Yes. <laughs> So I'll just simply say <laughs> that the carve out is for patients who are medical assistants. And so most of the people in the state of Maryland don't have medical assistance um, and they have uh, private insurance and they have challenges with network. The, the, there's fewer problems with network, at network adequacy on the Medicaid side than there are on the private insurance side. Um, and I, I don't think that the discussion is so much about carve in versus carve out. There's lots of evidence that shows that when you carve behavioral health services in that there's not a better um, care management process um, than it is for patients or for, for states that use a carve out system. And Maryland is one of many states that do, that has a behavioral health carve out. So I, I don't think that that's the argument. The argument, the conversation yeah. is really about adequacy of the network right. Right. Um, and um, yeah. And, and there, there are challenges with, with network adequacy, particularly for people who have, who are insured. That's really where the, the biggest challenge is with network adequacy. Okay. Or with private insurance, I'm sorry, let me be clear. Private insurance and I think probably self-funded groups. Correct. And even with self-funded in the state of Maryland, we have uninsured patients can get services through Medicaid. And so they have access to a full range and array of behavioral health services. Very good, thank you. Um, public safety and, and justice system. There we go. Thank you very much, Lieutenant Governor. Um, let's see, we've had one committee meeting uh, since um, our last full commission meeting. Um, and that was where we discussed assisted outpatient treatment. Um, and once again, I, I want to thank you, Lieutenant Governor, for attending that meeting for its entirety and uh, showing your continued leadership on this commission. Um, that hearing, we had presentations from Brian Stetton, the policy director of the Treatment Advocacy Center, and he presented on the experiences of other states with the assisted outpatient treatment model. We also had a presentation from Debbie Plotnick, the public policy director at Mental Health America, presenting on the INSET program in New York. Uh, that was followed by a deeper dive on a local case study. Uh, Adrian Bridenstein, uh, Vice President of Policy and Communications at Be Behavioral Health System of Baltimore, presented on the Baltimore City Outpatient Civil Commitment Pilot Program. And finally, um, we had a member of the stakeholder group, Dan Martin, present on the perspective of the Outpatient Civil Commitment Stakeholder Panel of the pilot that I just mentioned. Um, we could have talked probably for another two or three hours. Um, and so I encourage everyone to submit their written testimony through the standard process. And some of the testimony we hear today, you know, may refer back to this. Um, as soon as I'm done presenting, I'll put the link for the AOT hearing in the chat box. It's available on YouTube. And if you I really encourage everybody to, to listen to it at some point, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. Um, I'm not exactly sure what our next steps in Maryland should be. I think it's an important conversation to, to, to be having. And there's obviously strong feelings on kind of all sides of the issue. But like I said, I've been encouraging people who, ha who haven't been heard yet to submit their comments for testimony at these larger hearings. And I imagine it will also be part of the discussion that comes about as we, fertile, as we move towards the sequential intercept model state summit, which uh, Steve Hsu mentioned earlier. Um, our committee has been working very closely with the consultants at Policy Research at Associates, who we brought in through the SAMHSA grant. And I'm just absolutely delighted that Steve Shu and the Crisis Services Subcommittee have agreed to kind of co-chair the launch of this state summit. Um, they've really been incredibly helpful. Um, Steve Shu, Marion Gibson from the subcommittee, as well as Brandy Kahn and Marion Bland um, 
from MBH. Um, really, it, it's a big lift, and we're all working uh, to produce a really great product, which I hope you all all enjoy. Um, the agenda is almost final. I can just give you a quick overview. Um, on the first day of the summit, November 17th, this will be open for everyone to register. Um, and I hope that you will join us to hear from wonderful speakers and presenters who will be sharing their work at the, at the nexus of mental and behavioral health services across the intercepts. Um, so for example, we'll have a presentation uh, as intercept zero and one on the best practices in Maryland around community services and law enforcement and then move on to a presentation um, at intercepts two and three around initial detention, initial court hearings, and jails and courts. And once again, all of these focused on that nexus between the criminal justice system and mental health. And then the final uh, intercept package is intercepts four and five, which deal with re-entry and community correction. So that all happens the first day. Um, it's open and free for anyone. So when you guys get the flyer, I hope that you will share it with um, all of your colleagues and friends and family members who might be interested. Um, day two is a little bit different. This is where the rubber meets the road. Um, we'll have participants split into three different groups along those same lines at those same intercepts I just discussed. And so each of those working groups is capped at 25 people. So we sent out specific in invitations to people with expertise in those intercepts to get them to join one of these working groups. Um, and so the first part of the morning will be spent in these breakout groups, really trying to identify, uh, in addition to the best practices, the gaps in service that remain and our opportunities for improvement. Um, then each of those breakout groups will report back and we'll hear kind of what they found. And then over the Thanksgiving holiday, the good consultants at PRA will have hopefully put together a report that we can read when we get back. Um, so once again, I just wanna extend you know, my thanks to my co-chair, um, Linda Boneski. Linda, do you wanna say anything? No, <laughs> you did a great job. <laughs> well, well, Linda, you know, she's, she really keeps it, keeps it real, um, has offered a lot of great insights along the middle intercepts for us to learn from. Um, and, and then also Steve Shu, um, and um, we've just really put together a great event and I hope you will all attend. And when you get the flyer tomorrow, you'll all um, share that flyer with everybody in your network who you think might learn something or be interested. Uh, back to you, Lieutenant Governor. Thank you. Thank you. And it was a, a very good meeting that you had at the subcommittee. I was um, glad to be able to participate. Uh, I hope I didn't monopolize too much of the meeting in terms of my questions and comments. Um, but it, it went very well. And I, and it, it is something that, you know, we can, many can differ in opinions on uh, whether AOT is something that could be used and is of value. I think there's some that feel it can be used. Um, and even reading the, the uh, report, and I read the report again uh, with regard to the pilot in Baltimore, um, the, the way it was structured, they just didn't have enough people participating, but there was no one that said it wasn't working. Right. Um, so. And I know we, you know, uh, I saw Dan Martin want, is going to uh, speak today during our public testimony. I know he was not crazy about the idea. Um, and I, I guess I make the distinction that it, it's, you know, we, we call it kind of like the civil commitment. But in this case, it's it, the person still goes home. It's not where they're, you know, in an institution. Um, they are just, there's, there's some oversight. And I know uh, Dr. Bonesky, you know, in particular, looking at those folks coming out of the criminal justice system that um, are suffering, you know, to have some type of handoff and, you know, somewhere where they're going to get some additional assistance and, and not have to rely on them to just, you know, go and they just disappear uh, I think can help, you know, cut down on that revolving door or other challenges that we have in society. So, I mean, it's something to continue to talk about and maybe we can look at uh, limiting something of that nature to those folks coming out of the criminal justice system um, and tailor it in a way that does not, um, you know, 
cause as much heartburn to to some people as as um, the concept seems to do for for some. Can I make a comment, Lieutenant Governor? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I, I think that the the concern that a number of people have is is that here in Maryland we we value people's uh, ability to. Uh, control their own lives and we, we value personal liberty and we, we we don't want to restrict it unnecessarily. With this population of patients, I, I think it's important to point out that the, the way these programs operate uh, in the states that that at least I'm familiar with, um, the, the population of people that we're talking about are uh, either absolutely in need of being in a hospital, or they're not. But with this type of program in place, there's a very thin slice of people who, in the absence of a program like this, would be in a hospital. But with this type of program in place can instead be intensively managed in the community, which is a less restrictive environment. So for this narrow slice of patient types, this program actually increases their personal liberty and control over their own destinies because it takes them out of the hospital setting where they would otherwise be confined. Uh, th this program is, is not intended to be for the general outpatient population that is not in need of hospitalization. It's for people who, in the absence of this program, would have to be hospitalized. At least that's how my understanding of its operation in, in other states. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I I agree. I think it can be narrowly for kind of the the person that really has a challenge, but um, they're not necessarily, you know, put into a, a an institution of some sort. So I mean, we can we can look at that further as we um, you know progress. Um, I did just put the link to the YouTube. It's only about an hour long in the Zoom chat. So. Um... If you save that somewhere, then you can watch it, you know, when the news gets dull. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Um, okay. Um, it has, has everyone had a chance to look at the um, last year's report, year end report, and the recommendations? I don't know if you've had or not. Um, but I know that there are a number of the um, areas and Mark, you're still on the line. I'm going to ask you to, we, we went through and looked at, uh, try to get an update from the health department on a number of areas. Um, Mark Nugent, I believe is still out there somewhere. I'm still here. Yes. <laughs> Maybe you can uh, take us through those the uh, sure. areas. Yeah. Start with the, I guess it's the comprehensive crisis system? Correct. I've got that. And I want to thank uh, Webster Yee from the Department of Health who helped me put all this together and um, and his team, uh, the folks at MDH, uh, to put together this, um, the, what I'm going to go through here. So, so recommendation one um, was design a comprehensive crisis system. Um, the overall status is in progress, but the crisis subcommittee has identified additional uh, to-do items. Uh, MDH is reviewing and working on these goals. Uh, a lot of the progress has been unfortunately delayed due to COVID because there was all hands on deck situation as, as you all can imagine uh, with the pandemic. Um, from BHAs, the recommendations are um, research and review evidence-based crisis system models such as SAMHSA strategic plan, Crisis Now, continue to identify key service delivery components that work best for Maryland, continue to review language for crisis management, craft definitions acceptable to key stakeholders, from a crisis system advisory council that includes both internal and external stakeholders, identify performance measures and outcome indicators, uh, and continue to participate in the crisis subcommittee led by the OCT, HSCRC, crisis services efforts, and OMHC transformation work group is uh, what um, Director Shu had talked about previously. Uh, and I'll, I'll stop there for recommendation one if anybody uh, wants to add anything to that. One of the areas it was also, you know, in the report to look into is um, an evaluation of the state's current emergency petition standards. And um, I, 
I think we mentioned that once before that they were, you know, to take a look at a better definition of, you know, a threat to self or others. Um, you know, what does that mean? Because right now it's somewhat subjective. Um, and I think it's more that people take it as a imminent threat. Um, and so there may be at least some discussion of how that can be better defined. And I, I don't have an answer. I'm just, I'm kind of throwing that out. Um, if that's something that, that can be done and maybe Dr. Jones, I don't know if that's something that you would think could is necessary, uh, or if it's not. So, yeah, we've begun having conversations internally about looking at our standards for um, really it's the standard for involuntary commitment um, and um, trying to uh, expand them so that they are um, more clear um, and will lend, lend to a more consistent and predictable outcome when someone is uh, emergency petitioned to an emergency department and then um, needed to be um, uh, evaluated to be held against their will. So we are um, uh, pulling the, uh, the team together, legal team together, internal um, experts together uh, to uh, begin the work uh, that will obviously involve the stakeholder uh, input um, to, to look at that. But we do have the standards that are used across the country uh, and ours is, um, is lacking when we compare ourselves to some of the states that have more clear criteria for involuntary hospitalization and that informs your emergency petition process. So that would be the first step to get um, to work down to the other part of that. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, I wasn't being rude getting up and walking away. It's just it, the sun is leaving us now. And so I had to turn some lights on it. I noticed that it was looking at the picture of myself. I was in, in the dark. So I could see you all well, but I could see that I was in the dark. Okay, Mark, I'm sorry, continue. Okay, does anybody else have anything on um, recommendation one? Uh, if not, I'll move on to recommendation two, which is uh, continue coordination with the Behavioral Health Systems Care Work Group. Uh, that is obviously, it's in progress still. And again, uh, that, that falling under MDH, uh, the system care worker has been working on through 2020 on various technical implementation issues, but that progress unfortunately has been delayed to COVID-19, uh, the, the pandemic, uh, but we'll keep working on, on that and, and um, moving forward there. Uh, does anybody have any uh, comments on that? No, this is Trisha uh, Roddy. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're beginning to meet again and we are talking through a couple of the issues um, uh, and that, and we're, and we're planning out the next six months or so, but things, topic areas that we've talked about with the group are, is, is leveraging again, the work that our MCOs do in terms of network development. We talked about expanding, um, IMD services, uh, psych IMD services for, um, for adults. Uh, and we talked about with this, um, group, uh, a few meetings ago, um, and of course, we're working on the crisis services. Um, and we've got uh, several operational um, manuals that we're putting together, both at the ASO level and the provider, the local level. Um, so we're, we're, we're beginning to pick it back up again. Got it. Thank you. Uh, anyone else on number two before I move on? Okay. Number three, recommendation. Uh, three is increased uh, funding for the Second Chance uh, Act grant. Uh, and the Second Chance Act grants are federal programs. Uh, they were funded previously at $90 million across uh, all the states. Um, and from what I understand from our federal um, relations uh, department is that the uh, Congress, or sorry, the House uh, passed a bill uh, that would fund it at $100 million, but uh, like I said, with Congress being Congress, it's everything stalled. Um, so it's only, it's kind of just sitting there at the House Appropriations. Um, and it was not part of the continuing resolution funding that passed in October. So uh, we can do a little bit more work on uh, uh, working on our federal, with our federal partners to see if we can get that money out the door. 
Uh, and then on the state level, um, I know we don't have any Second Chance Act grants, uh, going at least according to the information I have from BHA, but there are uh, discussions uh, at the Behavioral Health and Criminal Justice Partnership, which BHA is a part of, um, but no applications have been submitted. Uh, so we can work further there to uh, get that process moving. And I'll open it up to on number three. Uh, I have a question. This is Pat Metashevsky. Um, this is funding that uh, we're increasing the funding. Is there any data? Uh, do we know how uh, effective this program is and what's, you know, what the outcomes have been so far? That's or something we can certainly ask uh, the federal, the uh, Bureau, uh, and then the name, the acronym is escaping me, but the the, fed, the the federal agency that administers the grants, we can certainly see if they have data from the states. Okay, thank you. That would be uh, interesting. I think it's BJA is the name of the agency, but we can certainly follow, follow up with that um, through our federal office. Uh, any more, any other uh, for number three before I move on? Okay. Uh, recommendation four is improve the crisis hotline. Uh, that is in progress. Uh, last year, the General Assembly did pass uh, HB 669 SB 584, which modified provisions of the Health and Human Services referral system. MDH is in the process of integrating the additional objectives into its workflow and assessing the next steps on this issue um, with Department of Human Services partners in light of the federal 988 program, or NAS the National Suicide Hotline announcement in 2020. Um, so that's where we are with that. And I know BHA has got several things in the pipeline to move forward with that, especially uh, along with our SOAR two grant funding. Um, and I know Dr. Kerry, you had reached out to our office to talk about this, uh, the, the suicide hotline uh, recently. So. Uh, I'll leave it there and open it up if anyone wants to offer any comments. Yeah, I had just brought it up because of the federal legislation that was passed about the 988 phone number. So yeah. I was just wondering how that was, you know, being worked into the whole process or, yeah. Well, I think we'll have to follow up with the federal partners too, because I believe the FCC also, since it's a it's a telecommunications issue as well, we're going to, there'll have to be some implementing regulations there on the federal side before we can get into it. Um, but so we'll follow up with that and see where we can, what we need to do to move forward and where we need to wait on from the feds. Yeah, thanks Carrie for bringing that to our attention though. Um, Moving on to recommendation five, promote standardized training in behavioral health. Uh, the status of that is ongoing. Uh, the Behavioral Health Administration has worked with providers in 2020 through 184 provider educational training meetings, 47 instructor-led WebEx training sessions, attended over 20, by over 2,600 provider staff and monthly provider council meetings to discuss and promote standardized training in behavioral health. Um, from BHA, uh, their recommendations and comments are they developed medication-assisted treatment for OUD and SUD training for our course for behavioral health practitioners. They developed a trauma-informed care, best practices training for behavioral health practitioners, uh, ethics and boundaries training for residential rehabilitation programs, residential substance use treatment programs, PRP recovery residence is scheduled on November 16th and November 17th and uh, core competency training for psychiatric rehabilitation programs were held in June of 2020. So it looks like we've had some, some nice uh, movement there. Uh, any other uh, comments on uh, recommendation five? Okay, move on to recommendation six, uh, ensure proper warnings regarding cannabis use. Uh, that is in progress uh, as we go. Um, there's draft uh, cannabis edibles regulations. They were published in the Maryland Register on October 23rd. Uh, the comment period ends uh, the, uh, towards the end of this month on November uh, 23rd. And uh, those regulations include labels and warnings. And uh, I'm, I will send out a uh, example of that um, 
out to the rest of the uh, commission if uh, we want to see what those the particulars of those are. It's um, and if you're interested in the citation, it's Comar 106201 through 37. And move on to any other questions. I can. I'll move on to number seven, which is um, standardized mental and behavioral health programming in schools. And we're uh, waiting upon MSDE for an update on that. So I will get with them and uh, contact Dr. Salmon's office to see where they are with that. And we'll move on to recommendation eight. And go back. Um, you know, I'd love to hear what MSD has to say. Um, mm -hmm. I, I talked to Christian. You, I talked to Christian Neely at the start of last legislative session about seeing what could be done in this area. And there's there's several states that have done, you know, <laughs> something. Um, and so I don't know if I could forward this information to the education subcommittee um, just to compare what other states are doing with what MSDE, you know, ha has done. I feel like they kind of fall into different buckets. Like there's the uh, training required of, of teachers, like uh, mental health first aid tra tra training of teachers. And then there's the training of the students themselves. So you can recognize you know, suicidal tendencies in your peers. Um, there's also states that have done um, consolidated resources, so like a one-stop shop for mental and behavioral health resources for um, children. Uh, Utah even has an app, you know, on a, on a smartphone that can connect you to uh, um, providers. So there's a lot that's going on. And um, while we, I guess my gut feeling is that MSDE, you know, has been dealing with COVID-19 this year as well as the rest of us. And so probably we're not as far along as we might be. Um, that is my gut guess. And so I'd really like to, you know, work with somebody on doing a comparison of where we are compared to what other, other states are. Sure, um, happy to get what MSDE has and share it with you and we can move forward from their center. Okay. We do that. Mary Gable, is there anything? Mary? Mary Gable? Hi, sir, it's Heather here. Mary is actually having technical difficulties. I'm trying to get her the call-in audio a oh, uh, number God. right now, and I will let her know when she's con let you guys know when she's connected, so she can comment. Okay. All right. Well. Okay. Um. So that was seven. Uh, we're on to number eight, and uh, that was uh, improve access to information and services. Uh, that is, status is ongoing, but we've got you know, the, the other things that we've done so far is we had the press two one one md dot org. Um, which is, uh, I'll send the link for that. We also have um, Promote FDA's uh, Remove the Risk Toolkit that provides information on how to properly dispose of medications. There's a webinar on how to administer naloxone, where to obtain it, and how to upload a naloxone electronic toolkit. Uh, that was done on a, a webinar, uh, that's gonna be on a webinar, for the Maryland business community. Um, BHA has also reached out to construct the construction industry, which historically has a higher than average substance use disorders amongst its employees. They provided information and resources to several construction related organizations. And um, resources are posted on BHA's COVID 19 webpage that include support groups and information guides for the general public, in addition to resources for providers, trainings, and webinars. Um, and I've got uh, this document, it's a Google document. I'll share this with the rest of the commission uh, when we send out the, the meeting. Uh, uh, once this is done and we get the, uh, some other uh, updates that we're waiting on, I will send this out to everybody so you can see exactly where we are. Hey, Mark. Uh, yes. Mark, this is Christian. Hi. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so MDOD, we just hired an IT accessibility coordinator who is a, a whiz at making sure that any uh, web-based applications, resources that are posted online are fully accessible to uh, people with disabilities. Um, so feel free to reach out to me and I can connect you with him. His name is Andrew Drummond and he is, uh, he's sort of nationally known uh, for his, uh, his work in this area. So we'd be happy to have him dedicate some of his day to making sure that all these you know, new updated sites are fully accessible. Great, that's awesome, thank you. Thanks. Very good, thank uh, you. And I think that was it. The other thing I had was the interstate compact, and we had talked about that uh, previously. And then, oh, I'm sorry, one more thing. Um, 
Department of Health, their assessment of emergency facility designation. Um, and I don't have any particular updates for that. So uh, we can, at this point, that was, and that was, wasn't a necessary recommendation. It was, it was an update from the 2019 report. Okay. Thank you. Any, <laughs> any questions about what Mark just went over? And like he said, he's going to send out the notes that he was working with. Okay. Um, Yes, it's a good time to take the public testimony. We have a couple of people signed up and maybe there are others on here. Um, first, Austin, um, is it Torch? Uh, good evening, uh, it, it's Torch. Torch, okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> oh, this, I didn't see the, this was handwritten. So the, C, the um, H on the N is, not quite there. Oh, it's okay. I know that S usually is tricky. Is the, is the yeah, truth. It looks like it, no. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, you're okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Austin Torsh. I am a family peer support specialist with the Maryland Coalition of Families. I should probably turn my camera on. Uh, I am a family peer support specialist with the Maryland Coalition of Families. Um, it's my role to support families and caregivers of those with substance use disorders. Um, a good portion of my role is supporting the parents of adolescents uh, with whom have a substance use or co-occurring disorder. Um, in my almost two years with MCF, I have witnessed an alarming rate of parents uh, with whom were seeking substance use treatment uh, for their child um, to little or no avail. Um, uh, to my knowledge and from what I've witnessed, um, unless you have been referred to a DJS program, uh, residential treatment does not exist uh, for adolescents in Maryland. Um, while outpatient programs exist sparingly, they're not available in every county, uh, making it unrealistic for parents uh, who would have to transport their children to an outpatient program on a consistent basis. Um, these lack of resources have forced parents to enroll their children in programs that focus more on uh, mental health over substance use, um, such as counseling sessions, um, and in some cases, uh, forcing parents to send their children out of state. Um, and that's if, you know, you're fortunate enough to have your insurance cover any of these alternatives. So um, you know, residential treatment facilities are a necessity for families with whom are struggling with a substance. I'm sorry, we're struggling with an adolescent with substance use. So, um, yeah. So thank you for your time and uh, consideration. Um, I, I'm writing notes of what you said. Um, I know we've you know, we've heard that before, particularly um, the earlier uh, task force that I had headed with regard to uh, heroin and substance use disorder. And excuse me. He's, he, he barks a lot. My, um, my wife and daughter, when they got him, said he was a breed that does not bark. So... But um, I know there's a challenge associated with um, children and adolescents. I don't know why he's barking, but that's, he's, he's only like this big, you know, so, but he barks a lot. Okay, so is mine. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I know there's a challenge and, and we had some discussions, particularly with the um, new hospital going, on, going in in um, Prince George's County in terms of how many um, psychiatric beds they have and whether they had any that were for children and adolescents and needing both on the mental health side and the substance use disorder side, the separation of you can't just have 17 down to six year olds or whatever all together. You have to have the adolescents and then the younger kids separated. And it's really having those kinds of, you know, arrangements. But um, yeah, that that is a challenge in terms of, uh, you know, how to take care of, you know, children that have substance use disorder uh, challenges. Now, I know Montgomery County uh, recently started a um, a high school program. Um, uh, for substance use disorder, um, I'm, I'm not sure how that's how that's going at this point, how far they're along with that. 
and I believe Frederick County has something similar, but it's for the older uh, young people, the the, um, the the upper teens, I guess, the high school age kids. So, well, thank you. Thank you, Austin, for um, coming on and, and commenting. And feel free to submit anything in, in writing if you have any more detail um, uh, with, with suggestions for us as well. So thank you. Um, Aisha Mann from Help in the Home. I saw that she was signed up to speak. Maybe my vicious dog scared her away. Um, oh, um, I believe um, Mary Gable is available to to comment with regard to um, what the Department of Education is doing with regard to training uh, within the schools. Mary, are you out there now? Uh, maybe not. No, I guess Mary wasn't able to get through. Okay, so I, oh, wait I a minute. am through. I, there she is. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I had to, I I had to be unmuted. I think I I'm on, and I apologize. My sound left. Um, so I I did did want to comment, and we had many things going on. So I'll just make a few comments. Um, one, we've done enormous training of hundreds of individuals on mental health first aid which is training teachers and administrators, bus drivers, um, anyone that can be trained, and many are trained as a trainer, to identify those um, behaviors that may indicate a mental health issue, and also training what can be done and, what, and who are the resources to refer the students to. That's a huge training we've, we have done. We've done multiple other trainings um, that we have in mental health um, and that we, I'd be happy to share with you a little um, further as, I, I'm sorry, I don't remember who was speaking, but um, he said he was going to reach out to Dr. Salmon. Um, my division actually works with student services and so on. The other is in, uh, I wanted to mention two big buckets. The other is that we have a requirement to teach health education, um, K to eight annually, and then also once in high school. So we have a graduation credit that's for um, health. In health, there are standards and curriculum that is taught to students and help them to understand um, such behaviors and what kind of help they can provide. So there's instruction. There is there are many many trainings that we do. As I mentioned, one example, and in the other area at the the young students at the K to two level, we also work with mental health in identifying at that level um, any kind of help that we can provide students. So I'd be happy if. Um, reaches out to Dr. Salmon, we would be happy to provide additional information because, and I appreciate uh, the Senator's uh, comment that we have been pretty involved with COVID and um, all of the um, instruction that's been going on and a new, uh, a new normal. And speaking of new normal, but however, this is a priority. It's been a priority of our superintendent of our state board. We've presented to the state board a couple of times on the initiatives that we have going. And um, we are working with the local school systems and, and doing a number of uh, presentations for them. So we would be happy to share that um, information with you. If you reached out to Dr. Salmon, I'm sure she will um, get in touch and we can provide some further information. So I do appreciate the construct, but um, we are very worried about students during this um, telework, this um, environment of online instruction because we don't have those contacts. As we bring students back, we're seeing more. And as you know, um, child views, the, the um, 
reporting is less than normal, but we know that it very potentially is continuing to go on. So we continue to make it a priority. So thank you, Lieutenant Governor, and I apologize. That, well, I don't know what happened to my computer, but I've talked to Heather a couple of times and she's helping me and I'm on a new computer, which doesn't have a camera. So okay. I'm pinch hitting here. Thank That's, you. Okay, well, no, thank you. Thank you. And um, it was Kristen Mealy, I think, who said he was gonna reach out to the superintendent. Right, Maybe right. That's fine. Be reaching out to you uh, on yeah. that. So, okay. That'd be fine. Very good. Thank uh, you, certainly. Um, I don't think uh, Ms. Mann is on. Dan Martin, you had signed up to speak? Yeah, Mr. Lieutenant Governor, okay. and the Commission, can you hear me? Yep, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak to you all tonight. Um, I just want to make a couple of points real quick. Um, around a couple of different issues. The first one is the, um, the ASO transition issue. Um, for those on the commission that are unaware, um, the state transitioned administrative management of the public behavioral health system to a new vendor, Optum Maryland in January. And to say that it has been challenging, I think would be an understatement. Um, we really wanna thank the Maryland Department of Health, uh, the Behavioral Health Administration, Medicaid, uh, everybody that's I mean, we really appreciate and understand that all the work that's going into this from all the parties, the vendor themselves, the providers, um, but we have serious concerns about continuing deficiencies in um, Optum's claim processing system and the resulting chaos for, for the community providers. And it's, it's having a, a really destabilizing effect on those community providers um, at a time of increasing demand. And we're concerned about the, the viability of the system and the impact on the public. Um, and those concerns are you know, so great that the Behavioral Health Coalition um, sent a, a letter to Governor Hogan a few weeks ago, we copied you, Mr. Lieutenant Governor, and several members of this commission, you know, co-signed by over 80 organizations from around the state calling for, for drastic action to rectify the situation. And again, I know everybody's working really, really hard on this, and, and we really appreciate all the effort, but just felt it necessary to impress upon this commission the level of continuing concern from, from the community around that issue. Um, the second thing, um, I just wanted to, um, you know, talk about not get into the AOT argument. Um, we can argue merits and advisability of AOT and relaxing the dangerousness standard for hours. And I don't want to belabor those issues here. Um, uh, but I do want to push back a little bit, um, and challenge the narrative, uh, that we've been hearing kind of in this commission and, and that's been echoing in some of the committees regarding Maryland's ranking in the eyes of uh, one particular group with a, one particular agenda. Um, we know that the Youth and Families Group, as you heard, even has a, a work group called Maryland's Ranking. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about this, this F grade or whatever from the Treatment Advocacy Center, but that report didn't look at Maryland's whole behavioral health system of care. It didn't evaluate the array of services that our outpatient mental health centers are delivering or our expanding crisis response capacity. It didn't look at the growth in our school behavioral health programming or our early intervention efforts or our network of peer run wellness and recovery centers. Instead, it looked at just two metrics, how easy it is to commit someone to treatment involuntarily, whether inpatient or outpatient. And so, you know, we have problems in the state, of course, you know, our, our public behavioral health services are underfunded. As you were hearing earlier, we have challenges with our, um, you know, commercial networks. Um, we need more harm reduction, suicide prevention efforts. Our, our system of care for children is, is needs a lot of work, but that's not to say that we have nothing. We actually have a lot to be proud of here in Maryland, and we're actually doing a lot better than other states. And that's why in another national report that was just released from Mental Health America, a report that takes a more holistic look at state behavioral health care systems overall and overall access to care, Maryland was actually ranked fourth in the nation for, for overall access to care. And so we, of course, have a lot of work to do. We can always make improvements. Um, and the behavioral health fallout from this pandemic is going to really you know, test us and require us to kind of double down on, on our commitments and our efforts. But to say that we're failing, that we have a failing grade and that Maryland is failing because we don't make it super easy to force people into treatment, I think is a little disingenuous and dismissive of all the great work that's going on around the state, all the work that's going on that the advocates and providers and, and peers and our government officials 
and everyone on this commission is really putting in to improve the lives of Marylanders with behavioral health disorders. And so I just want to thank you for all the work that you're doing. Um, I'm grateful I live in a state that um, takes these issues so seriously, and I look forward to uh, continuing to work with you. Well, thank you, Dan. Yeah, I appreciate the you know perspective in terms of you know addressing that one one report and and ranking that uh, came out. So um, I appreciate you bringing you know a bit more clarity to you know what we are doing. Um, you know the whole objective of at least what I had with putting together this commission is making sure that we reduce barriers to delivering services to those who are afflicted. Uh, with mental health and substance use disorder, primarily the co-occurring. And so it's, you know, looking at those gaps in the system, like you said, there, a lot of it is funding, but there are places where we probably can take a, a closer look of some areas um, in terms of, you know, how we get services to people that really can't care for themselves. And, you know, and, to that effect, to that, to that effect, um, I do have one, one more comment. I'm sorry, um, Mark. Yeah. When Mark was going over the kind of the reports uh, yep. about the, um, I mentioned the designated emergency facilities um, uh, efforts at the end, and that 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 there wasn't much of an update. Um, actually, the legislature did pass um, a bill this past legislative session um, to look at the designated emergency facility statute to to allow the Behavioral Health Administration to um, um, classify um institutions other than than general hospitals as designated right. emergency facilities for purposes of, of transporting someone on an emergency petition and so that's really going to help uh you know look forward to kind of that that work group effort getting up off the ground it's really going to help make sure that people in crisis and people in emergency petition get to a place that's m most appropriate to, to address those needs so right right yeah that was yeah one of the recommendations um from last year and particularly as it related to um, Baltimore City had, has set up a, a with basically with state funding um, a, a a crisis center or a, a place where people could go uh, other than a hospital, and it was, the idea is to free up those emergency rooms where the person is either having a substance use or a, a, a mental health crisis that they could go someplace where they could still get treatment and changing that that um, uh, regulation and the legislation made, made a lot of sense to be able to do that. So we'll see how it continues to progress. So thanks again, Dan. Thank you. Um, I didn't have anyone else signed up to speak, but if there is someone on, the, on this Zoom call, conference call that would like to speak, um, now's the time. Yes, good oh. Go ahead. Ladies first. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I did sign up, but at any rate. Oh, okay. I didn't get it. I'm sorry. Maybe I, oh, I know why. I signed in on the wrong link. That's why. It's, okay. So they didn't call me. Okay. Sorry. Anyway, thank you for offering. Um, so my name is Evelyn Burton. I am the advocacy chair for the Maryland chapter of Schizophrenia and Related Disorders Alliance of America, or SARDA. And I'm excited to share with the commission today the recently released outcome measures of the first 18 locations that received a four-year federal grant from SAMHSA to establish evidence-based assisted outpatient treatment or AOT programs. And I just have three slides. I don't know if I can screen share with them or not. Should I, I turn don't, that? I don't. I, Heather is the expert. I have no idea uh, whether, how you would do it and if you can do it. Uh, Ms. Burton, you should have abilities to share your screen. You can go ahead and try now. All right. Does that, there we go. No, that's not it. Whoops. That's it's the something. wrong screen. Ah! You did better than I did. I don't know. Wait, maybe I can get it still. Um, I may just do myself out here. Well, I, I'm not too good at this. So I'll, I'll submit it and, and they can post it um, online. Yeah, yeah, if you so submit I'll, it, please, we'll, we'll do that. I'll just tell you about it. Um, basically, um, as, as maybe everybody knows already, AOT is the practice of providing community-based mental health treatment under civil court order as a means of motivating an individual with serious mental illness who struggles with voluntary treatment adherence. 
So the locations for these grants ranged from small rural communities to large cities across 12 different states. And the results compare pre-enrollment data to data after at least six months of enrollment. And what they found was psychiatric visits to emergency departments declined 25.9%. The percent of participants with hospitalizations for mental health care dropped 85%. The percentage who spent time in jail decreased by more than 44%. And the percentage who spent one or more nights homeless fell by 48.5%. Also, 91.8% of participants agreed or strongly agreed with the statement, I like the services that received here. Separately, there were significant savings reported. Both Reno, Nevada and Baldwin, Alabama saw $1 million of savings beyond the funding of the program. And I must say, in contrast, according to last year's report from the Baltimore Pilot OCC program, it did not serve any new court ordered patients. There has never been reported any hard data on outcome measures for ER visits, hospitalization, homelessness, jail times, or cost savings. And the recent regulation changes only affect voluntary participants and will not do anything to help individuals who need a court order. So in my view, the Baltimore pilot has tried unsuccessfully to reinvent the wheel in dealing with court ordered patients. It's time for Maryland to plan and act according to the data and the evidence and move on from the failed Baltimore OCC pilot to evidence-based AOT for those who need court ordered treatment. And the Maryland chapter of SARTA urges the commission to recommend that an AOT statute be passed in Maryland as a first step. And thank you for all your work on all the various issues that affect our families, um, members, and, and people with serious mental illness. Well, thank you, Ms. Burton. Um, you know, I appreciate your, your testimony and, and all the work that you're doing and the challenges that, that are you know, bef before us. And, uh, particularly individuals with uh, schizophrenia and bipolar, uh, that's particular challenges there. Um, okay, um, I did get some uh, uh, additional people. Um, Jim Perone, is that how you pronounce your name? That's correct. Thank you, sir. All right, that one uh, right. Okay. There you go. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to speak. As the Lieutenant Governor just said, my name is Jim Perone. I have been both a clinician and a director of a substance abuse program and a youth service bureau for over 38 years. Sadly, the outpatient program that I ran and which served Baltimore County for more than 40 years is now closed due to the way programs are funded. Um, when grants went away and fee for service took its place, it became very difficult and as the state and insurance companies started requiring qualified staff licensed at the highest possible level, there were no significant changes made to the reimbursement rates, leaving many providers inadequately paid for their services. Um, I can tell you, at least for Baltimore County, all eight publicly funded substance abuse programs and two of the three youth service bureaus have now shuttered their doors. And while I'm aware that the focus of today was to talk about the need for inpatient programs, um, and I wholeheartedly agree that sending our children out of state is just wrong and not conducive to the best possible treatment, and best possible outcomes, there are some other concerns I just wanna keep in mind. Over my 38 years in the field, I have certainly found that inpatient treatment is not only a great option to have, but it's often a lifesaver. But we do need to address, I think, a more comprehensive system of care based on, for example, what I just told you has happened in Baltimore County. Outpatient treatment resources are critical in meeting the needs of adolescents and their families. The first place people ought to be able to turn for help should be right in their own communities. Um, if they can go to a community-based organization, they can get the needed support and appropriate assessment not just for what the problem is, 
but to get recommendations for the best possible course of treatment. And I can't stress enough the importance of a good comprehensive assessment. My experience has been that even though we've tried to talk about behavioral health as one grouping, too often mental health professionals see mostly mental health issues, substance abuse professionals see mostly substance abuse professionals um, issues. We need to make sure clinicians are trained um, about co-occurring disorders. And after an inpatient stay, certainly outpatient treatment serves a valuable role in reinforcing new behaviors, new coping mechanisms, all while providing ongoing support, which is critical to continued recovery. Um, so basically in summation, I just wanted to be here to say I 100% support the need for more inpatient treatment. Adolescent substance use is um, among the many pandemics we're working with, but we also need to advocate for a fuller and more robust continuum of care and a workforce that is appropriately trained. Um, thank you once again for your time. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Mr. Perrone. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Um, Christine Lewis, I have on listed here. Yes, hi, good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, I can. Okay. Perfect, thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. Um, just some quick background. I am the parent of a 16 year old who suffers not only from mental health issues, but substance use issues as well. And I wanted to share a little bit with you all this evening, our struggle in finding a treatment center that can address our daughter's dual diagnosis. Due to the lack of substance use treatment available to adolescents, we were left only um, seeking help from our primary care physician, not knowing where to turn. The PCP admitted that she didn't have the proper knowledge um, to treat our daughter and was really unsure of how to direct us to get the treatment that our daughter needed. I spent hours online and on the phone trying to seek help hitting roadblocks at each turn. We did end up finding a psychiatrist who um, would see our daughter. However, instead of receiving treatment for her dual diagnosis at a treatment center, she's seeing a psychiatrist um, for mostly the mental health side of things, but she's also willing to monitor her substance use issues instead of it being a complete treatment. Adolescents um, really need access to these treatment centers more now than ever. They need the proper help before they spiral, advance in use, end up with a criminal record, or become adults with full-blown addictions unable to function in our society. Our daughter is on board with the treatment that she needs, and she wants us to seek the help and to get better. And it's heartbreaking and frustrating, to be honest, that we continue to try to explain to her that we can't get the proper treatment that she needs, that it's not offered here in our state. Um, and we desperately need that treatment, not just for our daughter, but for the other daughters and sons um, who need equal treatment. So I just hope that there is some continued conversation on that. And I thank you for your time and attention in this matter. Well, thank you, Ms. Lewis. Um... You know, I, I know that it's a difficult situation and, and and that's why we, you know, look at the issues in terms of, um, you know, the insurance side of it to be able to pay for treatment, but also how we can get treatment. And we heard from um, Mr. Um, uh, Torch, I think I got Austin's name correct this time, um, <clears throat> with regard to challenges associated with uh, adolescents and getting treatment for them. And uh, those are things that we need to revisit. And particularly, as you said, the co-occurring situation, being able, you know, not just one versus the other. And I think that's what Mr. Perone uh, talked a little bit about that, um, that, you know, sometimes it's, a, you know, a, a specialty area, but if you have co-occurring, then you need someone who can um, uh, take care of both, both challenges. So I uh, appreciate your t talking to us and putting that in, you know, on the table for us to see what we can do to address that particular type of challenge. Um, thank you. I, I believe there was another 
person that signed up. Let me just double check. I don't think she's on, sir. You can move forward. Oh, okay. All right. Lieutenant uh, Governor, this is yes. Kathleen. If I could just, I apologize for just a second. Um, could the speakers, I'm going to put my um, email address in the chat area. So particularly um, Mr. Perone and Ms. Lewis, could could you please email me just to, so I have your contact information. I, I want to make sure that you're invited to, the, that you get the invitation to the MAPIA um, public hearing on November 23rd. And, and I'd also like to just explore some of what you've said, um, you're experiencing it with your own sort of network attempts to either to sign up for the network or to access the network. So if you don't mind, I, I would appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry for interrupting. No, no, no. That's okay. No, no. Any, anyone else have any um, questions or, or responses to the public uh, comments? Okay. Well, um, as mentioned before, we have our final meeting will be in December. Final meeting of this year. We we will continue uh, of this year is, and I don't remember my date, but I think it's December 8th. Was that correct, uh, Heather? Um, maybe I lost Heather, but I believe it's December 8th, uh, but we will get notices December out there. 8th. You said it's what day? It's yes, sir. It's December 8th. Okay, good. Okay. I can remember things beyond 30 minutes. Okay. Um, so we will we'll be um, working on getting our, our report together uh, with suggestions. I think we're going to have, you know, another conversation and, you know, probably some conversations with Dan and his group uh, with regard to AOT um, and, you know, if it can be done, even if it's a, a pilot, you know, with our, um, our criminal justice system, uh, because I, I, I do feel that there's, you know, a, a need for some additional supervision for some of the people who, you know, are unfortunately coming out of these, this situation. But, um, you know, we can let the debate go on. I mean, I think that's something that you know, is probably ripe for our legislature to, you know, really take the testimony and, and hear both sides and and uh, see what we should do from there. But I, I do think it's something that we should at least explore. It doesn't have to be draconian. And I think that is the concern. And I, I know we don't want to be in situations where we're, you know, I often say where we're, you know, locking away our, our, uh, cousin who happens to be an heir into the Tower of London or something, but um, it doesn't have to be, you know, that bad. Uh, but there are people who need the additional supervision uh, and they can have a form of liberty, um, but still be required to, you know, at least meet with somebody at a periodic time, uh, discuss the issues that they're confronting. And, and maybe it's, you know, just for some period. So we'll see. We'll see. Um, and like I said, that might be something that we can at least suggest that the legislature take a look at this um, uh, in some form. But with that said, um, those who are uh, who either publicly testified, the public members who testified, um, and others who may be listening in, feel free to submit uh, comments. Um, you can go to our website and that's or send send comments either be by, via email um mbh m as in mary b as in boy h as in harry uh, dot commission at maryland.gov mbh dot commission at maryland.gov to submit any comments or testimony uh things that we should consider so with that said uh Thank you everyone for uh, their continued commitment to this. Thank you very much Thank you. and good evening. Thank you.